over to Kelly and Jen here in just a moment. And just uh, FYI, there's a sign-in sheet making its way around. So <coughs> kindly sign that and pass it to uh, the next person. We'd really appreciate that. So, um, great. Thanks. All right. It's all yours, Kelly. All right. Do, do we want to do an introduction? Sure. Okay. That sounds great. Actually, let me introduce, so we, we have a new employee, Jesse Jackson, and he helped he helped put this presentation together, and I told him I wanted to bring him over and show him where all the magic happens. So. <laughs> so. The vending machine's on, too, yes. <laughs> it's magic. So we can go from there. Jeff Einfeld with the division. Will Dominion Energy Classified. Yes, Wheel Revolution, Howard Lugo, Overland Consultant. Steve Beacon representing the American Natural Gas Council. Gavin Mengelson, Office of Consumer Services. Steve Schnarr, attorney with the Office of Consumer Services. Jennifer Clark, I'm counsel for Dominion Energy. I'm Kelly Mendenhall with Dominion Energy. Tricia Schmidt, AG's Office for the Division. Eric Orton with the Division. Carol Revelle, Public Service Commission. <coughs> Reed Page, Summit Energy. Justin Christensen, Division. Mike Platt, Dominion Energy Engineering. Uh, Dave Landward, uh, Dominion Energy Regulatory Affairs. Sherry Vance Commission. Eric Bartinson, Kissy. Melanie Wright, Legal Counsel to the Commission. Joseph Holland, Legal Commission. Kevin Higgins, Consultant to UAE. Jeff Fishman, also with Dominion. Kevin Barr with the PNC. All right, thanks. Uh, so we received some questions from the commission, from the office, and from UAE. So what we've done here is just uh, put them in you know, PowerPoint presentation. We'll just go through them. And I thought I'd start with the office's questions because theirs um, provided some good background uh, that, that we can build off of as, as we go, go along. So first question the office had was uh, regarding table on page five of Mendenhall's testimony, please more thoroughly demonstrate how peak day allocations were derived. So this is what table five looked like in my testimony. And I'm going to turn the time over uh, to Dave Landworth to talk a little bit more about how peak, day allocate, or peak days are designed, peak days are calculated. I won't, I won't, take, uh, I won't take much time, but obviously you know, if you've got questions, I want to I want to clarify some terminology. When I talk about design peak day demand, I'm talking about the total firm consumption um, for the entire 24-hour gas day period. That's 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. So I'm talking about the full consumption throughout that 24-hour period. And specifically, I'm talking about the consumption under design peak day conditions. Uh, chiefly when the mean temperature for that 24-hour period is a minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the mean temperature for that 24-hour period. There are two components uh, to the peak day, the, the firm peak day demand. I've got firm sales, and then I've got firm transportation. Um, I derive those two numbers differently. The firm sales is estimated through statistical, statistical analysis of daily sales uh, historically against variables that affect that. I'll talk about those in the next slide, but I just want to emphasize that there's a difference in, in the way the numbers are derived. Firm sales is, derived, is estimated statistically. Firm transportation is just the summary of the daily firm demand uh, contract amount for each transportation customer. I go customer by customer. Yes? For the temperature, where is that? Where the location of that temperature. Oh, I'm sorry. That's in the, that's what we call our Salt Lake weather zone, which encompasses the majority, excuse me, the majority of the Wasatch Front. So it wouldn't be like Park City. It would be the no. specific okay. regional area. Yep, just along the Wasatch Front. Um, <clears throat> as far north as Brigham City, I believe. Did I get that right? Yeah, and as far south as Provo. 80% of the volumes come along the Wasatch Front on a daily basis. Yes. Okay, and then, but, but then the estimates in the derived <coughs> kind of peak day Excuse me. allocation um, still, even though it's all derived from, from this part of the state, still is going to be used for, let's say, Logan and some of the parts of the state. It's a system-wide number that we're deriving. Right. 
those guys will be tanked by St. George. But right. Right. So, they're so, not going so to. So some regions so might, system 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 might be lower. Yeah, and, and, and on the engineering side, that's regionalized. But on, on, on the complete peak day number, peak, design peak day number that you see in the IRP every year, that's derived using what we call a top-down approach, using daily system-wide send-out numbers. With that particular, with that virtually region-wide in terms of the number of customers being represented. So, oh, Dave, so, so just to clarify, so, so, so our engineering group does it, what, what we call a bottom in Kings. Yeah. Sorry, Jerry, the phone got hooked up late. You want to go ahead and introduce yourself really quick? Hi, it's Jerry Mears from Exeter. Jerry Mears with Exeter for the office. How does he spell his last name? So, so Dave does the top-down approach where he takes overall uh, system usage and, and calculates what the peak day would look like. Mike, in engineering, does the bottom-up approach where he takes the meters in all the regions, takes the different temperature uh, for all the weather I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear a thing. That's going to be a problem. Can you hear it now? Can you hear, can you hear now? Uh, barely. Can we pass the microphones around? How about now? Can you hear me now? No, because that's the stream. That's the stream. Oh, that's not going to help. Nice, oh. Jerry. Do you want to simultaneously try the streaming on the PSC website? Utah PSC. Okay. What do I do? Uh, what's it's um, psc.utah.gov. And once you get to that page, open up, there's an event calendar on the front, open up today's event, and there'll be a listen now. Um, today's event, tech conference, uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, listen now? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's a YouTube. So when you compare the top-down approach by Dave and the bottom-up approach by by Mike, they are they're very, they're very comparable. Again, they're not exactly the same number, but they're uh, close enough. Close enough yeah. Okay. Um, any more questions on just this overview? Firm sales statistics, firm transportation, just adding up every transportation customers. Daily firm contract and if they have it. Do, do you know for the daily firm contract amounts if that's uh, do firm transportation customers take more than that on their you know in historic peak days have they you've done an analysis on that? I don't know if if I'm the right person to answer that question. Well, so so the way we would treat it is anything they burn above that that demand amount that they paid for is treated as interruptible. So on a peak day, they would be asked to reduce their usage to the firm demand okay. amount. Okay. And then if, if they obviously if they use more than, than that amount, they would be penalized for those interruptible volumes. Um, that's even if their marketer did in fact deliver that volume up and over at your FDQ. Correct. Right. Correct. Yeah. Which means that the marketers then have zero incentive to over deliver into the system even when the system really, really needs gas. Okay. okay. But there is the option you could sell us that gas. Yeah, that's true. Right. If you if you had extra gas and wanted to over deliver gas, you could always sell it to us. Our tariff does allow the option for you to sell it for us to buy some. So we could just make come to some arrangement where you just buy the gas. Okay. Okay. But if there are no other questions on this, let me drill down on this. Uh, let me drill down a little bit on the firm sales piece. I'm not going to get into the mathematics. Uh, mathematical guts of this, but I just want to explain 
at a high level what we're analyzing, what variables we're looking at when we estimate firm sales under design PPA conditions. We're looking at daily firm send out. And we're analyzing that against the variables that we know affect it. Um, temperature that we express in heating degree days. Is everyone familiar with that term? No one I'm talking about heating degree days. That's going to be the chief driver, obviously. The colder it gets, the more gas. We're going to burn for space heating. Another big driver is what was used the day before. There's a connection between what's used today and what was used yesterday. That's a variable we want to look at. Wind speed. Average wind speed, maximum sustained gusts. Those are both, those both have a significant effect on the daily firm sales. The day of the week also has an effect. The, the data show us historically that firm sales on Fridays, on weekends, on holidays are lower than what they are typically Monday through Thursday. So we want to account for that. So we're, we're, we're using statistics to, to quantify the effects that these variables have on that daily uh, firm sales send out. Now we're going to take those quantifications, we're going to apply them to design peak conditions. The minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit, which translates to 70 heating degree days. We're going to take what the data shows, the maximum sustained wind gust, the maximum average wind speeds. We're going to, uh, we're going to place that under a Monday through Thursday condition. We're going to put those together. We're going to apply those quantifications, and that's going to give us an estimate of what firm sales is going to, going to be for the day under design peak conditions. And then, of course, we'll add that to that, the uh, daily firm contract transportation amounts, and that's how we do have our complete daily number under design peak conditions. Have I stimulated some questions with that? <coughs> Well, I'm assuming this is just some kind of regression analysis. Yes, it's a multivariate statistical regression. Is it a multi-year uh, yes. data set that's in there? Yes, going back as far as two, going so as far back as 2003 mm -hmm. on daily center data. Now I'm really pushing my memory. So it's some kind of panel data set. Uh, well, yes. I mean, it's more. It's probably more of a time series and. Daily time series. Okay. Yeah, that's that's more how it's being treated. Because I've got I've got numbers every single day as far back as January 2003 on firm sales and transportation. And then for I mean, the company has how many different zones? So are you collecting data? Is this just primarily the Wasatch Front data? This or is exclusively, or is it from the whole system? This is the whole system. This is system-wide so send out. Do you have a variable in there for the temperature zone, or whatever it is? How are they classified? I don't. I don't have a variable for temperature zone because I don't have the, the send out date, data split out by the weather zone. I've just got system-wide send out. <coughs> that that. The, region, the regionalizing is, is what's done on the engineering end. Yeah, that would make it a panel if you had it by okay. So heating degree days and usage are driven off of data from 2003 forward? Yes. You're equating old data? Um, we have used a time trend in there to try and uh, account for kind of changes that, yeah, that can happen over time. We didn't find it at the time to be statistically significant. Yeah, we wanted to put in there to at least control for it. Um, the weather can fluctuate so much day to day, year to year, that I think that probably just gets lost mm -hmm. in the noise. But that's a good question. Excellent question. So the impact of uh, EE and DSM would be just embedded in the usage? Yes. Uh, just a clarification, when you figure out your load for the um, firm uh, sales customers, yes. do you assume minus five temps for all of this state? Well, or? I'm 
on the top-down approach that I'm that I'm describing here, I, I'm assuming minus five in the Salt Lake region. Uh -huh. That's the variable that that's the variable that I'm using against system-wide data. Uh -huh. Now that probably seems like um, an inadequacy, but that's that minus five is that minus five degrees is going to dominate the system-wide setup because it's going sure. to account for about eighty percent of all the setup. Um, obviously, we want to be able to get more granular on that for engineering purposes. That's why Mike regionalizes it. That's why he's got temperatures, peak day design temperatures for all the different regions that he analyzes. What I'm doing here is the primary consumer for this is gas supply, and so um, and so I want to analyze uh, their target, which is going to be the send out, everything coming into the system at all the receipt points. Okay. Thanks. And, and so that's why I need to do it in aggregate. Mm -hmm. But, but the, yeah, the reason we've selected the, the Salt Lake region's temperature for the, the heating degree days for the, um, for the system wide daily sounds because it, it is going to be the key driver. So when you say send out, you're not talking about the send out model that uh, what's his name? Scott Nelson does. Scott does. No, you're talking about the volume through your city gate. Yes. Yeah. All the volume, the total of all the volumes coming in the system from every receipt point. Good questions. What else can I answer for you? Okay, I can hear crickets chirping. That's my cue. <laughs> so just to summarize, just to tie this back to this table. So the regression that Dave was talking about for all the sales customers, when he has all those numbers up, that's the number he gets for sales customers. The, so the regression using the historical data, um, the five degree, or maximum speed. And then to get the transportation, he just simply takes the contracts for every tra for transportation customer, finds out their demand, adds it together, and comes up with that amount. So that's how we get to, to that number of the So that moves us to on to the second question uh, from the office, which is please explain how the total usage from the table on page five relates to the estimate of peak hourly volumes demonstrated in exhibit 1.3. So Mike Platt and I both read this question and answered it differently. So I'm going to let Mike answer it, and then uh, I'm going to answer it, and then we'll see, uh, hopefully between the two of us, we can we can get an answer. Well, so <clears throat> we have this question a lot internally, and I hear it a lot externally, so I'm trying to, to break it down by going through my day. So I live in Sandy, and I have a commute every day driving to the Salt Lake Operations Center. Now, during the day, I have some meetings, I, I go to lunch. It's possible that I come downtown and, and meet with you people, but I end up at the operations center and eventually I drive back home. Now, my drive home is a little bit slower than my drive to work every day, and it's because I drive to work at 6 a.m. So I have a, a morning pull, I have some travel in the middle of the day, and I have an evening and this is a lot like how our volumes are throughout the day. But if you think about it, I traveled about 20 miles in the morning, very little throughout the day, and about 20 miles in the evening, but it took a lot longer. So if we look at this and we add it up over the day, well, I traveled 40 miles in the day. And that's what the daily peak day would be. But if you look at it, on a rate basis, well, I went 70 miles an hour during the morning, which is about 1,700 miles per day. And then at lunchtime, a lot less, and in the evening, well, my evening drive is a lot slower. So if we look at this and we try to connect it to how our system actually works, well, miles per day is like the daily volume. It's like peak day. And the colder it gets, the further I go. Now, that's not actually true with my commute, but that's how it feels. My traveling speed is like my hourly rate, and the speed limit, wherever I'm at, is equivalent to the system capacity. And what I mean by that, and this correlates really well, I can exceed the speed limit at times, 
but I'm going to pay the price. There's only a certain amount of time that I can do that before there are other constraints. So system pressures upstream allow us to flow more at times, but we're going to hit, hit a wall at some point and have to hit, come back to that speed, speed limit. So if we look at this in exactly what we have in our send out, well, or in our peak day, we're flowing some volumes pretty steadily throughout the day, and if we add those up, we have our, our peak day estimate. But throughout the day, the rate is changing. And so this peak hour, well, you can't have any day without a peak hour. You have a peak rate every day. Unless we didn't send out anything, but you're going to have some peak rate. Now, it, in a theoretical world, could you imagine that the, the rate would be equal to the day? Yes, but that's not how our customers burn gas. And so every day we're going to have some peak volume, some peak hour. <clears throat> and I'm going to turn it back to Kelly, unless you got questions for me on this specific. So how does that relate to to this chart? So um, talk a little bit about how these peak days are derived. Now let's look at let's look at uh, how those numbers are used in Exhibit 1.3. So this is Exhibit 1.3. So this purple line is the peak day. The blue line is the peak hour that uh, Mike has modeled. And this peak day is the, is actually the peak day that we calculated in our last year's IRP. Now, since then, we filed a new IRP. The numbers are slightly different, um, but conceptually, uh, the answer is the same. So, uh, the sales number, you'll remember that number was the sales number on, uh, on that table. And then I add to that the transportation uh, peak day number. And then I also have a special contract customer whose, whose name I will not say, but we probably all know who it is, uh, who, ha who adds an additional 210,000 decatherms. And so when you add these three numbers up, you get the, the total peak day number that's, that's been in our IRP. Um, so what happens on a, on a peak day is we have enough upstream firm transportation to cover ourselves. For the most part, I don't know if if all the transportation customers have firm upstream transportation, but let's assume for this example that they have, they have they've acquired it. So they will be covered as long as the, their gas shows up on the upstream pipeline. They will they will get enough gas delivered to the city gate. And then the special contract customer I know has enough firm upstream transportation. So we're covered on a firm basis up to our peak day. Now, as you can see, um, the usage, actual usage is going to go over that. On, on a peak day, um, and so this this amount right here is basically swinging on the upstream pipeline, and that's done uh, on an operationally available uh, basis. So if if the pipeline can do it, it will. But to go back to Mike Platt's uh, analogy, there's going to be a traffic jam on a peak day. There's going to be a lot of gas flowing. And on an operationally available basis, if you look at the models, probably not going to be available. So the way that we're proposing to solve this is to go out and acquire these firm peak hour contracts. And what they will do is on a firm basis, basically, the pipelines will pack the system a little bit extra so that during these hours, they can guarantee this flow on a firm basis. And so that's really what we're trying to do here. Um, so I want to know, I'm looking for the guy who asked the question. Does that answer that question? Okay, well, so based on the way you explained it, the allocation of 13.9% is based on the total of demand for the peak day line. Right. And then you're using that same uh, allocation and applying it to that amount that is about peak day. That yes, peak yes, yeah. that's, that's exactly right. And, and the reason why we're leaving this special contract customer out is because they are a special contract. We could charge them, but they, they wouldn't pay it. They wouldn't have to pay it because they have a maximum bill that they pay. Uh, so what would end up happening is, is we, we would calculate them, include them in the rate, 
charge them, they wouldn't pay it, and then ultimately it would get allocated back to these folks at the end of the day. So that's why they've been excluded from the calculation. Okay, last office question. Please explain the significance of Wasatch and non-Wasatch volumes and how you apply it in the allocations and rate calculation. I'm, I'm glad everyone looked at, this, at the source detail behind the graph because the truth of the matter is this, this information was actually a, a data mining project that one of our analysts who, who was in graduate school did for, for her graduate project. And so she took all of the data and she, she broke it, Jessica Ibsen, if you know her, broke it down into granular data so that she could do her, her project. But for purposes of what we're doing, we don't use any of it. We don't use the large or small. We don't use Wasatch, non-Wasatch. But since you asked, the Wasatch uh, customers are all the customers from Tremont to Payson in the Wasatch run. Um, and then I think there was a large and a small. Large customers are, are all customers over 25,000 hectares, small under 25,000 hectares. So it's interesting data. If you're, you know, if you're a data nerd, um, enjoy looking at it. But for purposes of what we did, we looked at everything on a system-wide basis to calculate all of our rates. Okay, so now let's move on to the commission questions. And you'll find the trend here is that the commission found uh, some errors in our filing, and so most of the questions are related to those errors, and, and we're, we're going to hold up to them now. So um, the question is on 105, uh, the sentence says both the transportation and sales customers' peak hour demands are added together to calculate the total peak day demand. If peak day is calculated by summing the peak hour demands, please explain the distinction between peak hour and peak day. So that was actually a typo. That was a good catch. What that should look like, that sentence should read, both the transportation and sales customers' peak day demands are added together to calculate the total peak day demand. So that was a typo. Confusing. I know I got that question from a couple of people, so um, I should have had you read my testimony before I filed it. Uh, next question, line 89 refers to non-weather sensitive usage. Please explain how DEU calculates non-weather sensitive usage for transportation customers. So we actually don't calculate non-weather sensitive usage because we don't weather normalize transportation customers' um, usage. But since you asked, we thought we'd give it a shot. So how we calculate non-weather sensitive usage for our sales customers is we take those customers' lowest usage and the lowest daily usage um, in either July or August, and that is that represents their non-weather sensitive usage because you know there no one's furnace is on when you have uh, zero degree days, and so basically any usage that's that's happening on that given day is is water heat. It's not space heat. So we did. We tried to do the same thing with transportation customers. It's not as easy for all for a couple of reasons that I'll explain. But if you just strictly take the July and August numbers of last year, look at the lowest usage for every transportation customer uh, during that time period, your lowest, your your total um, non-weather sensitive usage. Now this is everybody excluding Lakeside is 49,000 hectares. The problem with that, as we looked at the data, is there are some customers who were just off on some days. I don't know if it's weekends or maybe they're doing maintenance, but they, they had zero usage. And so, is that a good, you know, is that a good representation of what their non-weather sensitive usage is? I don't know. So another way we looked at it is we said, well, let's take their July and August usage and just average it and give give us the average daily usage. So we did that, and when you do that, this is what the, the usage looks like. It's about 182,369 decatherms. Now the problem with this exercise is you've got some industrial transportation customers, for instance, asphalt plants, whose highest usage would probably be in July or August. And so they're probably skewing the data a little bit. Um, and so another way to look at it um, was we looked at the median. And so if we took the median usage for all these customers, it ended up being 92,000. So that's about the every, every way I could think of to, to try and calculate it. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, if you look at these transportation <laughs> customers' like low profiles, they just don't. I mean, they're, they're, they're much flatter. And it just, just for, for grants, we looked at the highest usage for every customer from January 16 to 2017, and that's what the number looks like. Um, 
But I had some data in my testimony that, that kind of showed the usage for transportation customers versus sales. Uh, this is a graphical representation. You can see the, the sales customer is a red line, and they really use a lot of gas in the winter. Uh, transportation customers, they have, they have a slight peak in the winter, but it's, it's, it's much, you can see much flatter than, than a sales customer. And so that's why I, I, the rate design was based on really peak day rather than, than usage. Yeah. That slight peak that you see on transportation customers, is that, is that growing over the past years or is it, is it recent? That's a good question. Um, and I don't know the answer. Uh, well, actually, it would be growing, right? Because we've been adding uh, about 100 transportation customers a year for the last, what, five years? So, yes, this, I think this peak would be, would be growing over time. If you were to compare this to prior years, it would be higher. Other questions on that? Okay, so number three. Um, on Exhibit 1.2, we showed projected peak day volumes and, and we provided historical estimates of, of peak day volumes. Um, so please discuss how forecasts for these years have compared with actual peak day volumes and then B, there appears to be a significant jump in the forecast between the first five years and the last two years. Please explain the reason. So I'll let Mike um, talk about that a little bit. So compare uh, peak, projected peak hourly peak day volumes to actuals. We haven't had an actual peak day since 1963. We came awfully close in 1990, uh, one degree away from negative five mean, but that being said, I'm gonna show you the high send out days. So 2010, 2011 uh, heating season, we had our high send out day on February 1st. It was a 19 degree mean. I don't know if anyone remembers all of these days, but they were cold, I promise. The 2011-2012, we had a 24 degree mean on December 6th. Uh, our peak day estimate was quite a bit higher than that in terms of how much volume we were using. In 13, or 12-13, we had a, a high send out day on January 14th, and it was a six degree mean getting a little bit a little bit closer there but still quite a bit away from peak day conditions 13 14 we had a 20 degree mean on December 13th and again we're, we're not even close to approaching it in 14 15 we had an 11 degree mean and we actually had an interruption the day after this event. 1516 on the 1st of January, it was a 12 degree mean. And on 1617, the most recent, we had an interruption this day. We had a 6 degree mean day, and we we're getting awfully close, but still quite far away. And if you're curious, this is the, the 1718 graph that we have for our peak day flows throughout the day. So the question, there's quite a large jump in what we see on these graphs in the recent years. I, I have to admit this was an error on my part. This particular graph has been used as a discussion piece for engineering and we've been watching the trends, but going back and looking at it, the uh, actual curves on this chart should look like this. So uh, 16, 15, 16 is this black line. 16, 17, which wasn't shown before, is this dotted red line. It's it's a lot closer. So, but there still is a, it appears to be a jump there between the lower years and those other two. You know, if you look at the hour, like from the green line up to the to the other the next two, yeah. This this day, if you look at the blue line, uh -huh. you have a very steep uh, curve here. Uh -huh. In order to hit the peak day volume, we had to uh, push a lot through the gate at that peak hour, so through the gates. As we've 
kind of grown into our peak hour services that we're signing up for. That we're, we're pushing more, we're packing our system more early on in the day, and the peak to mean is uh, less because of that. So but these are all peak. These are all theoretical peak days. Theoretical? Theoretical peak days. So they're all using the same line spot? Degree. Correct. <laughs> to the green line, from the green line to the lines above that? From the green line to the lines yeah, it's above a, that. It seems like a lot bigger jump than and from the other The green years. line was 11 and 12. Uh -huh. And the blue what? line that you're looking at is 15, 16. So there, there's a balance between how we pack the system and how we draw from the gate station. So if you follow these from the bottom up, you can see that the daily volume is going up every year mm -hmm. and the peak hour is changing depending on how much pack there is in the system, where we can bring it in, and what options we're using to actually operate on this theoretical peak day. Why is there such a large increase in total system volumes between the green line and the blue line? So, this so, is so a year, year over year, those volumes are going up. They're going up. Okay. So, this is 2000. Green is 2011, 2012. Starts here and peaks out here. This blue line <coughs> is 15, 16. Starts much higher. The peak day estimate was higher. And ends up much higher. I think he's what he's asking is what information do you have as to what's caused this jump? The magnitude of increase between 15, 16 and the prior years is significantly higher than from 11, 12, and 12, 13, and 13, or 14. So I, I agree with what you're saying. I can see the graph I created. It. Uh, what I'm saying is this lower volume here represents a lower state of system pack at the beginning. This higher volume represents a higher state of system pack, but also it was going, it was increasing. So if we increase our system pack, you look at this orange line, it's pretty close here. We're bringing in lots of volume early on in the day, and so its jump is a lot shallower. When we add service, when conditions change, we have to operate differently. And so how much pack you can bring onto the system depends on what you can actually fit into your gate station. So if you think about this year in particular, in 1314, we uprated feeder line 26. We went from having a 354 pound inlet into our Payson gate to having a 720 pound inlet into our Payson gate. So we're bringing a lot more through Payson in this model than we had in previous years, and that that is the, the difference. Would the difference also be uh, customer additions? I mean, in 2015, we acquired Eagle Mountain, which is a faster growing area than any other area in our system, and, and the, that acquisition has caused our customer growth numbers to, to be higher in 15, 16, 17 yeah. than they were in 2014 prior. Correct. Agreed. Real quick on the time. Your zero hour, is that 8 a.m. or is that? This is midnight. When, when we model in engineering, when we model peak day, we do three peak days consecutive. And I like to start at true zero. Sorry. Here. So you packed your system on those ones that started the higher axis. So this year. Exactly. So we're this this represents feeder line 26 at 720 at the beginning of the day. The other gate stations as high as they can possibly be at the beginning of the day. So it looks like the last three, four years, we've increased the packing here. We've had to change those conditions. So it's it's really hard to ex explain. I mean, this is like I said, a graphical representation of every single station in the system. 
and everything we do at every one of those impacts how this <coughs> But basically, the starting point is higher. You have to have more gas in the pipes. Yeah, you're, you're bringing more in early. You're packing it up early so that you can withstand. Yeah, so you the, can narrow out the, the peak and drop. Exactly. Right? So you don't end up with this insane kind of almost like gas duck curve situation. Yeah. <laughs> So, so the volume you're bringing on for the peak day doesn't necessarily change. It's when you can cram it in there. It's when and how. So that it's not just being called in at, uh, I guess, what would that be, 930 or whatever. Exactly. Well, I have, all of it at the same I, time, right? I have two constraints in my models that are very important to me. The MAOP, the maximum huh? allowable operating pressure, and the system operational minimum, which is 125 for most of the system. Uh, so I have to so operate within there. So you're like flat and bird this whole thing, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, you're only I'm trying to get my head around all the lines and the theoretical data. Would it not make sense or perhaps be more uh, realistic to graph the, the known data for the for the particular time periods and help help me understand that problem. So so the problem with graphing known data is if we go back to here, our high send out day was a six degree mean. That represents this curve. So if you want to graph real data and then theoretical data on top of it, what you're saying is for the one million customers, you have to take this and then approximate this. That's what we're doing already. But using this actual day adds no value because you have to change you'd have to change all your factors, you have to change the entire model. And it really is not even close to these conditions. Does that make sense? I, but you do, you do in your modeling, go back and compare your models with actual data, right? To, to check their right. validity every, for, for, the, for the theory. So back every every yeah, year we, we do verification and we post the results in the IRP, I'm sure everybody's read this. It's my favorite part. It shows how accurate our models are. Uh, we use a cold day that was a, a normal day and we compare our theoretical model to the actual conditions. So we're taking pressures at over 100 IHP locations and over 100 high pressure locations, and we're comparing what our calculations, our calculated demands, and calculated pressures, how they compare to actual system conditions. So we do that every year. That's not what this graph is showing, though. This is showing a day that never happened. If we if we had a negative five mean day, I would love to show it on this graph because it would line up well. Yeah, don't, don't, <laughs> don't, let, don't don't say that. Let, let's just say <laughs> if everything happened exactly the way it is in the theoretical world, it would line up very closely. But in reality, we know that uh, some of our interruptible customers would continue to burn, and this would be shot. Um, gas wouldn't show up when it needed to uh, because we'd have well freeze-offs and other complications that keep me up at night. Just to clarify too, your projections do not include interruptible customers. They do not. So you're assuming that all interruptible customers interrupt. Well, that's what they're contracted to do. That's right. the, the theory. So if they don't, it's going to make this even worse. And it will definitely be worse. <laughs> I think one important thing here, Mike, is that, yes, if, if you took the same exact load profile from for, for all the customers and just applied that load profile with the peak day, right, that even peak day, then every curve would look exactly the same, right? But that's not what's going on here. What's going on here is this is a representation of, this, of, of the theoretical, the, the modeled send out at the gates based on meeting that that peak day demand. So this is what Mike is doing, he's optimizing each day in the model to match the pressures. 
and this is the results of that. It's not applying the exact same load profile to a, a straight line and saying, okay, this is how that load profile is going to change. This is the results of him optimizing each one of those years. Does that make some sense and kind of clarify the difference a little bit? Why it doesn't exactly look the same? It's not the, just profiling the, the load and, and multiplying it times a bigger number. Does that help? All right, we, I tried. <laughs> we, we, can talk, we can talk about it more if you'd like to, to meet some other time. I mean, this, this is what we show in section four, the pressures that result from the peak day that Dave comes up with, that is all of section four. These are the representations of what the send out would be on that day. I'm still getting blanks there. Well, I mean, I think for me, the question was answered by Kelly saying there's additional uh, customers on the system and that's what's uh, driving the total system volumes to increase. I think it's a simpler question than you're interpreting. Well, oh, yeah. that has happened before. <coughs> I'm sorry. So, so I think yeah. Blake's there is good. I can only play the hand I was dealt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn it back. Thank you. Okay. So uh, this this question was asked already. Uh, other people saw the, the data in Exhibit 1.5 and wondered what all this non non uh, Wasatch large Wasatch means and. Uh, once again, 25,000 decatherms or above is large, below is small, and then Wasatch was just the, the Wasatch. Uh, there was another question um, in that same spreadsheet um, pertaining to column system wide less TS. When subtracting TS total values from system wide total, the results appear to be different. Uh, that was labeled incorrectly. The label should read system wide less lake side. So that was the issue there. Okay, so there were a, a couple of um, questions on the tariff or, or proposed revisions. Um, one, one it was pointed out that, that on the MT rate tariff, this is a new charge we're proposing, we didn't break it out on a monthly basis, and we also didn't refer to Section 501, which is where uh, this peak hour demand charge is in the tariff. Um, so this is kind of what we, what we thought we needed to do, and I agree it's a, it's a good, good change. So going forward, I think we'll add a new section for firm demand, and then we would uh, add the monthly equivalent. Uh, similar question on the, the TS and MT1 rate schedules. Um, there was no reference to Section 501, which is where the, the peak hour demand charge is. And so um, we would propose to add that in as well here in the purple, just so it makes it more clear for the treatment tariff. So are these charts available somewhere? I mean, yeah, so what, what you see in blue is what is in my testimony in the red line. Um, right. And then I, I don't know if that's in your corrected testimony. Um, yes. So this hasn't been done yet. This this would that's probably right. need to be done in rebuttal, or, but, but this is what it will look like uh, when it eventually gets filed. So. so blue is what we originally filed, purple is what we will, what we will add. So I think that covered all of the office or all of the commission's questions. So uh, UAE had a couple questions. One, explain how the company chose 100,000 decatherm volume for peak service and why it is or is not adequate or more than adequate. So um, we signed up for 100,000 decatherms on Kern River, and uh, the reason why we chose 100,000 is due to gate constraints and takeaway capacity off of Kern River. That currently is is pretty much as much as we can take from Kern River. And so, um, as many of you know, in our integrated resource plan, we're planning on building a, a new gate station on Kern, and when that happens, this, this number will, will increase. But for right now, for, for the next three years at least, until 2019, this is as much as we can take from Kern River. Now, if you look at our integrated resource plan, the difference between that peak day and that peak hour is about 340,000 deck terms. And so, Clearly, 100,000 isn't adequate. It's just not going to cover it. And so, uh, currently, we we have signed a proceeding agreement with Questar, with Dominion Energy Questar Pipeline, to to sign up for uh, an additional service from them that would fill that gap. 
And currently, they do not have an approved tariff. They do not have an approved service. Uh, they had a customer meeting this week, which is required. In order to go before the FERC, they have to have customer support. So we signed the proceeding agreement. And I think the plan is in the next week or two, they will uh, file with the FERC to get approval for their service. And, um, and then uh, assuming it took Kern River four to five weeks to get approval. I don't know with no quorum if, if they're going to get, to get approval. Maybe, maybe a staff person can approve it. I don't know. But assuming they get, they get their, their service approved by the fall, we would be signing up for an additional, um, or for, for the difference on Questar or Community Energy Questar Pipeline. And, um, and we, I think the plan right now would be we would sign up for a one-year agreement with them and then go from there in, in this upcoming winter skiing season. Yeah. What is the total number you're, you're trying to achieve with this new service? So plus what? I think it's I, if you if you look at our IRP, it's 340 is, is the magic number, and then the derivation of that number is where? Uh, well, it, it would be in our integrated resource plan. It would be the it would be uh, Mike taking the peak day and and calculating a a, a differential basically, right? To come up with it. I believe that number is in our integrated resource plan, right? Yes. That's that's where you would see the detail behind that. Figure 8.2. 8.2. But that's still assuming that you can't cram it in early morning, right? Well, it's not an assumption, but yes, yeah. you cannot cram it all in early morning. Well, or, or a chunk of it, right? Because you were still well under early morning. I mean, well under. We're, in, we're packed up as much as we can be. And actually, that that is how. So, so it's assuming that they're already doing as much as they possibly can. All right. Cool. Right, and, and that is how the Kern River service works. Is they allow us to basically prepack, uh -huh. and then it's almost like we'll ener energizing the line. And then during those hours when we need it, they give us excess over over our firm. You know, so, and, uh, and Quest our pipeline can handle another two hundred forty thousand. Um, yeah. So, so the way they do it is they're actually going to reserve capacity on overthrust. Um, so there, there's actually 40,000 deck terms on overthrust that they would normally sell that they will not sell. They will basically hold this for this service, uh, and then yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a slingshot. They they use the, the overthrust pipe to kind of bring a whole bunch of gas in at one point and, and yeah, and energize the system exactly. Shut the floor. Exactly. In, in addition, with our aquifers all at once. Yeah. So. Uh, the other question, explain why the Dominion proposed to collect the cost of the peaking services and demand charge. Um, so maybe I'll go back to the TS uh, tariff sheet. So we're kind of, uh, our transportation service, you can be an interruptible or firm transportation customer and receive service under the same tariff. So really the only item on this tariff that, that differentiates a firm customer from an interruptible customer is this firm demand charge. And so someone who is firm on our system pays the firm demand charge based on you know, how, how many decatherms they think they need on a daily basis. And um, the interruptible customer doesn't pay that, but they pay all the other fees. So as was mentioned earlier, when we're modeling uh, our peak day and our peak hour, we assume all interruptible customers will be off. And, and we expect them to be off. I mean, that's part of the contract. And so, because of that, um, really, we're only proposing to assess these charges to firm customers because, really, these services are being purchased for to manage the, the firm peak hour on a, on a peak day. And so, that's why we propose to put it all to, a, to, the, to the firm customers to pay for through their demand charge. Now, it was pointed out earlier that, you know, interruptible customers, there might be some that, that use on a peak day. And we have a $45 penalty in place to, uh, as, as, a, as a result of that. And so I kind of feel like that's taken care of. That, that penalty ultimately gets collected and given back to all of the other customers um, through the infrastructure uh, replacement tracker. Um, so so they, they would be reimbursed uh, for, for any interruptible customer to use uh, when they're interrupted. So that's kind of the thinking. Get off the interruptible? Right, and then right, and then the second second piece of that is they're required to 
increase their firm amount to the amount that they burn on that day, and so they would be paying these charges going forward for, for the next three years. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. So that's kind of why we why we propose it that way. So those are all of the questions. I'm happy to answer any other questions. I look like you all look like a put you to sleep, so I'm guessing there are going to be any more questions. Okay. Thank you. Jen, will these